So, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for attending today to our fifth Fenier Distinguished Annual Lecture. It is a great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce today in this lecture, which is going to be taught this year by Professor Nina Jablonski, which I'm sure all of you know. She's co-director of the Center for Human Evolution and Diversity of the Pennsylvania State University. And, well, there are many things I could say about Nina, so I have to make an effort to be brief uh, and, and concise. But, well, Nina, as you all know, is a biological anthropologist that is known in all the world because of her reference work and seminal contributions to many broad aspects of human and primate evolution that range from bipedalism evolution to the evolution of hair and the topic of tonight's lecture, the evolution of skin, human skin and skin pigmentation. Well, she's an elected member of the National Academy of Science and of the American Philosophical Society, an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, among many other merits. But apart from that, and you will see today, this is a bit also of the idea of the distinguished lecture, is a party, is celebration. Apart from that, apart from being a brilliant scientist, she is an empathetic, vibrant, joyful, intelligent, and shiny human being. One of those that really give hope <laughs> for a future in a present of a species that sometimes is giving us a bit of trouble to understand. And yeah, that seems to be sometimes more focused about the things that separate us than about the things that unite us. And I think this is interesting and this is indeed important. And I could have not chosen a better person and a better topic today because the distinguished lecture is about that. It's our most distinguished event where we want to bring an important scientific topic and research, life research indeed, but that matters for society that it's something of interest for everyone, for every human being, and particularly skin, which is our first interface, the first things we see, the first uh, surface of interaction. And that has been probably the feature that has been used more often to separate us, to confront us, and indeed, what Nina is gonna show us, and has been showing for many years in a brilliant way, is that it is indeed this diversity what should be uniting us, because this diversity is indeed part of the same song of adaptation and survival and flexibility and success of our species. Let me also finish by thanking Nina, among many other things, for her generosity. Uh, she has graciously donated to the Fenier, an impressive collection of casts of the world old monkeys and small fossil primates that are now available and enriching our comparative collections at the Fenier. 
we are very proud, we are very grateful for the important contribution and you know, we have them ready, we are working in the availability to do what you wanted, is that they continue to support scholars and researchers in the broad field of paleontology and this is what we do. We are very honoured that you chose us to be the, the recipients, the hosts of this collection and because we humans like stories, I'm going to tell the little history that this collection has and I think it makes it even more special and emotional to have the collection in our room because this collection uh, now, this Nina Jablonski collection of the primates is sitting next to the Clark Howells collection that was also graciously donated through the work and collaboration of our first distinguished lecturer, Professor Tim White, who's here. So I think we are getting these distinguished collections given by our distinguished lecturers, and we love that. And I think it's important because Nina, and today was telling us the story, she's uh, referring to Clark Howell as her academic grandfather, because he was indeed the one who was encouraging her PhD supervisor, Gerard, Gary Eck, to do this collection. So when he retired, he gifted this collection to Nina. She continued to make it growing. So I think it's special to know the story and the history and the emotions that are behind these collections that now sit together and make us feel very proud and, and very happy about all these, about all these coincidences and the way that life at the end is uniting all of us through these links. So, well, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, Nina. I'm sure we are all going to enjoy very much this lecture, and this is going to be, again, a beautiful, beautiful party of uh, science and friendship. Thank you, Nina. Maria, I cannot thank you enough for that beautiful and generous introduction, and to all of you for, in, for inviting me to be part of this beautiful celebration in your remarkable institute. What, uh, what an exemplar of beautiful scientific knowledge. It is, the, it is the modern time, and it is the future, and it is here. It's just fantastic. You have been marvelous hosts, and I feel so honored to be able to, to speak to this group today and to talk to you about something that you may not think about so much, especially from your rich site of Atapuerca, which yields so many wonderful fossil bones, skeletal remains of, of animals and humans, and lots of stone tools. Today, we're going to talk about something entirely different, but something incredibly important. The integument in my title refers to the skin and the hair and the nails. I won't talk about nails today, but I am going to talk about skin, skin pigmentation, and hair, because these are extremely important parts of the human evolutionary story, but ones that are often untold. When we look at our beautiful primate relatives, they all look roughly like us in the face. We can recognize our, our relationship to them, but they all have a lot of hair, some more, some less. And when we compare them to a representative range of modern young people, we see that there are a few striking differences. First of all, we pay attention. We are visually oriented primates. And so we pay attention not only to the non-human primate faces, but to our own. And we see differences in, in facial shape, eye color, skin color, and hair texture. And these are what we consider to be remarkable differences, important differences. What I want to show you today is that these are indeed important functional differences that have a very sort of small basis in genetic differences between groups of people. So we're going to explore this frontier today. So looking at the evolution of what most people call naked skin. When you look at your own skin, you realize it's not naked. You have little hairs that are very important. So it's functionally naked. We'll talk about the evolution of scalp hair, head hair, and hair form, something that people have many, many questions about. 
And lastly, but certainly not least, the evolution of skin pigmentation and differences in skin pigmentation and what those mean to us. I think we must start, of course, thinking about where our ancestors lived. And when we look at a modern map of Africa, this is from the UMetsat, just taken a few days ago and the image captured, we can see, uh, uh, albeit with modern, let me just make sure I can get my pointer, yeah. We have modern topographic features, uh, including the desert and, and areas of equatorial forest that probably were not the same as they were uh, several million years ago. But one of the things you can get immediately is that Africa, our homeland, is an enormous place with varied, uh, varied ecological uh, zones for habitation. And also, because of its position astride the equator, it receives a lot of sunlight throughout the year. And when we look at the pattern of, of some of the early hominin sites of our ancestors, we see that these are all very, very close to the equator and certainly within the tropics. So these are areas that received high amounts of solar radiation throughout the year and during most of the day. And I think to, to recall that all the key members of the, of the human lineage emerged in equatorial Africa uh, is extremely important to this discussion today. One of the challenges that any mammal, including any of our non-human primate relatives or humans face, is the challenge of keeping relatively cool, especially keeping a functioning brain when the animal is exercising in the sun. Now, these, these beautiful zebra and wildebeest have a remarkable mechanism for keeping cool, even when they are undertaking sustained running for long periods of time. Because when we look at their circulatory system, and specifically when we look at the base of the brain, we see that the artery that supplies the brain actually flows through a pool of cooled blood coming from the nose. So these animals are running, running, running very quickly. They breathe in air. The air gets cool over the nasal passages. And the, the blood running through here, through the carotid reti, gets cool before it goes to the brain. What this reti does is it allows, oops, what did I do? Oop, there we go it lowers the brain temperature relative to the body temperature so that there can be a dissociation between the two. The animal continues to run and it can maintain a relatively cooler brain. So this dissociating brain and body temperatures is actually used by most primates, most mammals, except primates. So when we look at our beautiful cousin, the savanna baboon, you would think, oh, he's got this gorgeous long nose. Certainly, the same mechanism could be used to help cool his brain when he is moving in the open land. But in fact, it doesn't. He has a big long nose, mostly for decoration and mostly in order to, to help him display his beautiful canine teeth. Uh, but in fact, he lacks that carotid reti mechanism. And so when we look at the primate brain, here it is, and there is the carotid artery flowing directly through this little pool of blood called the cavernous sinus. So instead of having this little network of blood vessels to cool the brain, it has it receives, the brain receives blood directly that is heated in the core of the body. This is actually enormously important because in animals like our close cousins here, these lovely chimps from the Fungoli site uh, that are taking a little breather on a hot day, they are sitting in a cool pool because they are hot. They can't just cool their brain, they have to cool 
their whole bodies. Primates lose heat throughout the surface of their skin by radiative heat transfer and also by evaporation of sweat. When those chimps get hot, they can only cool down by stopping activity, and in this case, actually by sitting in a cool pool of water. So for all primates, the primary mode of heat loss is evaporative cooling from sweat glands that are located in the body. And primates have to have access to fresh water. This was essential in human evolution and in the evolution of all hominin ancestors. So when we look at a reconstruction, one of the many reconstructions of, of an early homo genus ancestor, what we can see here is, is a familiar face, first of all, a familiar skeleton. But what we were interested in doing in trying to understand the evolution of skin was to figure out what the physiological requirements of that individual were oops, in, in a hot environment. We have a tall, relatively lean individual capable of powerful locomotion, sustained walking, probably bursts of running, as well as some sustained running, but certainly active and importantly, generating a lot of body heat in a very hot environment, at least at part, during parts of the day. So we reconstruct, and this is work done by my colleagues, uh, Dan Lieberman and David Carrier, looking at, at reconstructing the estimated heat loads by understanding differences in locomotion between a typical Australopithecine and a typical member of the genus Homo. Um, this, this is uh, familiar to many of you, but basically we can, we can make good hypotheses about the levels of energy expended during locomotion by looking at the conformation of the joint surfaces, seeing if these individuals were capable of some running as well as sustained walking, and then making hypotheses about what their heat loads would have been. And so the result of our ruminations about this actually have been translated into this little graphic that I call the hairy timeline of human evolution, uh, which, which depicts uh, the, the conformation of our skin before our ancestors, human ancestors, split from the ancestors of African apes. So here, all higher African primates apes and monkeys have lightly pigmented skin covered with dark hair of different colors. What we see and what we reconstruct on the basis first of anatomical and physiological evidence is that, is that human ancestors around two million years old, earliest members of the genus Homo, including the Turkana boy and other members of Homo ergaster, would have lost much of their body hair at this time. And so the, the hair on the timeline becomes thinner. And this, this is extremely important, that at this time, the, the functional interface between the hominin body and the environment becomes mostly naked in order to facilitate the evaporative uh, cooling of the body by an increased density of eccrine sweat glands. I'm not going to go into the now quite well-known developmental evolutionary biology be behind the evolution of a higher density of eccrine sweat glands, but all of you benefit from those as you walk around Burgos today. It was hot. Everyone was sweaty. You know that you have a high density of sweat glands. And we estimate that this increased density was occurring right around this time as hominins were becoming more active in open environments. So we have, uh, uh, at the same time, an increase in eccrine sweat density and 
a sweat gland density and a loss of functional body hair, although a retention of the tiny hairs because of their importance in, in skin healing. And here, I think I, I always like to stop here with this dramatic uh, reconstruction of Homo ergaster because it reminds us that at this time in human evolution, and for most of Atapuerca times, and most of the duration of human evolution, that the skin is the primary interface between the interior of the body and the environment. They do, there was no built environment. Hominins may have taken shelter, but they didn't create shelter at this time. And they also uh, really, really relied on, on social interactions to keep warm. We can reconstruct that not only was the skin the primary interface as they, as they moved around and foraged and hunted and scavenged, but that they also would have come together in the evenings when it was colder and done a lot of social huddling, just like most non-human primates do. So when you cuddle up at night, it has a long history in human evolution. But I think it's important to recognize that not all hair was lost. We retain important parts, important patches of hair, notably on the top of the head. We have been interested in this problem for years, but only about seven or eight years ago uh, did I joyfully come upon a student who wanted to study this with us. And again, we must remember that our hominins evolving, you know, early in the in the well, in the Pliocene and Pleistocene are living under this, this strong equatorial heat. And Tim, there's already under the under the direct equatorial heat within 10 degrees of the equator. Our, our biped is experiencing sunlight directly overhead for most of the year, much of the day, during most of the year. So this is an intense load of heat as well as ultraviolet radiation. What does this mean? It means that somehow the head has to be specially protected because it is more vulnerable to, to heat stress. So how does scalp hair protect uh, from heat stress? And if so, you know, what form of hair works best? So this is, this is the topic that we sought to explore. And by we, I mean uh, my former student, now Dr. Tina Lassisi here, who is getting ready to start as a tenure line faculty member at the University of Michigan, and Professor George Haveneth from the Environmental Ergonomics Laboratory at Loughborough University in the UK. When, uh, when Tina and I were working to develop this project, we were talking to some colleagues of George about doing some simulations of, of hair and how could we test that, that hair and hair form might have some relevance to temperature regulation. Our colleague at Penn State, Larry Kenny, said, you must talk to to George Haveneth. And indeed, George was the right person to go to because he introduced us to, to these, what are called thermal mannequins that are used to study the, uh, the function of athletic clothing, of military uniforms, helmets, and the like. These are in an environmental ergonomics laboratory. This is the primary way of, of stressing a simulated human body. We came to George with an evolutionary question instead of a practical military or Adidas Nike question. Uh, and we, we said, can we try using the thermal mannequin with different uh, simulating sunlight and putting different wigs, natural hair wigs, on the thermal mannequin in order to test whether hair, any form of hair, helps to reduce heat loss. And if, if it does, does one form of hair have any advantage over no hair at all? So we tried different forms of hair, and we simulated in the environmental chamber 
uh, different wind speeds here, and we had dry and wet conditions. We couldn't make natural sweat for the thermal mannequin, but we were able to, and there's, there's Tina putting in some of the temperature sensors into the, the wig of the thermal mannequin, and there is George putting some si simulated sweat, basically just spraying some water on the thermal mannequin before we actually uh, get it going. And this, uh, this experimental setup was really very good. And Carla, if you could just, uh, there's a little video. There's, the, there's our environmental chamber going. You can run it again. The, the fans and the simulated sunlight. We did this with multiple fan speeds, multiple temperatures, and with the different wigs, as well as no wigs at all, and the, with sweat and without sweat. And this, this, was, this formed part of Tina's uh, doctoral dissertation. What we discovered was that hair, regardless of texture, helped to reduce heat loss from the body. Uh, and that it minimized heat gain from the environment. And so by reducing the amount of thermal radi radiation that actually gets to the hair surface. So if you have some hair, it is going to actually reduce heat loss. But if you have the curliest hair, it will, in fact, reduce, uh, it will decrease the, gain, the potential gain of heat from the sun. So the curliest of hair actually keeps you the coolest by increasing the, the length or the, the the, the amount of space between the top, the surface that receives most of the radiation, and the surface of the skin. So this was an incredibly fun project to do because we were able to show that probably the evolution of tightly curled hair was related to thermoregulation, to helping us keep cool when we were active in hot environments, and that and that this, in fact, may have been the, the ancient hair form for hominins that may have created or uh, made possible the, the, the quickened increase in brain size. As we know, the brain is temperature sensitive, and when you can release some of the temperature stress on the brain, through something relatively simple, like changing the form of the hair, retaining hair, but then changing the form of the hair, that this could be a wonderful economical uh, advantage. So we then became, uh, and I have been fascinated by this, we have now mostly naked hominins with hair. And what do they do with it? This part of the lecture I confess it is completely speculative. Well, not completely, but mostly. Because what humans, what humans have done through time and what is virtually a cultural universal in all indigenous cultures that have been examined and, and recorded is people decorate themselves. And they not only decorate themselves with some kind of different clothing, broadly speaking, but more often they decorate their skin and they do something creative with their hair. This is an important form of human communication. We often think, oh, this is, this is meaningless, it's not so important, people paint their faces, they do something with their hair. These forms of visual communication are extremely important because we are so oriented, especially toward faces. And so the way that people decorate their faces along with the rest of their bodies, and the way that they, they create hairstyles that focus attention on the head is extremely important. And I would argue this has been important for thousands of years. And we know that humans love to decorate themselves regardless of where we find them. They're, they're using natural materials to decorate themselves. We have evidence 
uh, approximately from 70,000 years ago, a piece of incised ochre from South Africa that was probably used along with many other pieces in the cave, in this particular rock shelter to decorate rock surfaces as well as the surfaces of human bodies. And humans traditionally decorate their faces in a variety of different ways. And today, of course, we, we use new materials to accent the same features uh, in new and exciting ways. And these, this is one of the biggest areas of modern cultural development. Often, academic scholars think, oh, this is frivolous. It's not, it doesn't have any meaning. But for most people, it has enormous meaning. How do you look? How do you communicate your identity and what you mean to yourself, to other people? This is how it is done. And similarly, we have an ancient history of applying tattoos. We have evidence from more than uh, 5,000 years ago of this, this tattooed ankle on the so-called Iceman uh, from northern Italy and southern Austria, and traditional tattoos as, as on this Burmese lady. Uh, these, these have been done for thousands of years. And we find archaeological evidence, especially in Melanesia and Polynesia, of tattooing implements that are thousands of years old. And of course, tattooing, you just walk out today on the street in Burgos, and you see not only this is not just the Iceman's tattoo on the ankle, we have modern tattoos on the ankle. Some of you may have tattooed ankles. And celebrities getting tattoos that have fueled the craze in tattooing uh, in, the, in the popular culture now for the last two to three decades. So this shows no signs of abating. These are statements of, of communication of identity, of individuality that are extremely important, especially in an age when many people are, have access to some of the same ready-made clothing and they feel that they must find a way to make individual expressions. And I am particularly uh, intrigued about what people do with their hair, and I'm getting ready to write a book about hair. Because when we look at a complex hairstyle, as on this, this beautiful natural braided uh, hairstyle, what we see is something that has terrific visual impact. Beautiful, often high volume, very complex design. And you realize that most of this work is social activity. It takes more than one person to make these complex hairstyles and often to make the makeup that is very, very complicated or the body paint. So we're talking about human activities that involved intense amount of sociality that probably were very important even in Atapuerca times as people not only looked after one another but began to think about their appearance and how they came across to one another. So to go to the now one of the other themes of the lecture, which is the evolution of skin pigmentation, we must again come back to our, our friend, the sunlight and the strength of sunlight. And this, this work was a lot of fun to do, but it took us many years to, to really gather all of the data in order for us to make a good hypothesis about the evolution of skin pigmentation, because we had to first try to understand what the evolution of skin was and nakedness, and then how did the stronger, more powerful wavelengths of ultraviolet radiation, how did these relate to patterns of skin color that we can study. So we did a huge collection of skin reflectance measurements, and we did statistics on the relationship between those reflectance measurements and the strength of ultraviolet radiation. This map was produced from NASA satellite data that collected ultraviolet radiation at the Earth's surface over many years. The person who did all of the work to distill all of the ultraviolet radiation data and to make different uh, 
visualizations of the data and to be able to do the statistics, the statistical tests between the strength of ultraviolet radiation and skin pigmentation is sitting right here in the front row. George Chaplin, my co-author on many of our early uh, studies and happily also my husband. So, uh, so he and I worked together. It took us many years to amass all of these measurements and for George to create these, these wonderful maps. Now there's something really interesting about these ultraviolet radiation maps because we see some predicted patterns. The, the, the really bright pink and red colors are very strong ultraviolet radiation, as you would expect around the equator. And then there are cooler colors, including these gray colors, as we get closer to the poles. One thing that we often forget or don't think about at all is that much of the land mass of the continents today is in these northern latitudes where the levels of ultraviolet radiation are relatively low throughout the year and they're highly seasonal. So think about, here's, here's, our, here's our little hominins in Atapuerca, okay? Well, it's far away from the equator. It's not the, it's not the life of the ancestors in equatorial Africa. So this is something to, to, to give thought when you think about how, how these ancestors, how these close relatives in Atapuerca were actually living and what conditions they faced. Anyway, so what we did was we, we interrogated, using spatial statistics and conventional statistics, uh, this relationship. And what we were able to show is that, in fact, uh, we see a very, very strong tendency toward, toward increased pigmentation under high levels of ultraviolet radiation. This increase in pigmentation, we now understand the genetic basis of this. When we did our original work, we did not know that. But we now understand that this pigmentation probably increased under the, various, uh, under the continued evolution of the homo lineage in Africa and the very strong influence of ultraviolet radiation that continued. Oops. So we have, as the, the, the last main feature, this naked skin has high sweat gland density, loss of most, most functional body hair, but also permanent eumelanin pigmentation. Eumelanin, uh, an incredible molecule that I'll show you in just a moment. So here are our active ancestors uh, with mostly functionally naked skin, probably uh, curly hair. This is, again, hypothetical, but probably curly hair that, that would naturally break when it got to uh, any length because of the natural brittleness of the hair shaft and darkly pigmented skin. I want to spend a little time talking about the properties of the melanin pigment because it is just such a remarkable molecule that is used in so many contexts in evolution. When you look at butterflies, lizards, mammals, humans, we see eumelanin being used as one of the major uh, pigments to impart color to the integument. And this eumelanin is a very, very long complex polymer that absorbs very, very strongly in the in the shorter wavelengths, the shorter ultraviolet wavelengths, it's like a molecular sponge for absorbing these, these damaging wavelengths of ultraviolet radiation, as well as visual, the visible spectrum. So that's why it appears dark to the eye when we see it. So this is a remarkable, powerful mo molecule used over and over again in many contexts in evolution. And it protects the body against many kinds of damage. And ultraviolet radiation is a very powerful and mostly damaging negative force. But skin pigmentation, 
we have hypothesized has been fine-tuned in order to permit some ultraviolet radiation, especially of the shorter wavelengths, so-called UVB radiation, in order to penetrate. And I'll tell you in a moment why that's important. So in our, in our fundamental work, we demonstrated very high correlations between ultraviolet uh, MED stands for minimal erythemal dose. This is mostly UVB radiation and skin reflectance, the way in which human biologists, anthropologists, and dermatologists actually quantify skin color by shining light of specific wavelengths and seeing how much comes back. So we demonstrated very high correlations. And, and here, this, again, George's statistics demonstrating that ultraviolet radiation alone accounts for more than 86% of the variation in human skin pigmentation with temperature and humidity and rainfall uh, comprising much less of the effect. Now, we became very interested in the effect of ultraviolet radiation on the skin. And we became especially interested in the relationship between ultraviolet radiation and the important B vitamin, folate. For many years, for decades, it had been thought that skin pigmentation evolved in order to protect people from skin cancer. But skin cancer generally doesn't kill people in their reproductive years. So as a mechanism for promoting natural selection, it's just, it, it, it is not valid. So when we found out that ultraviolet radiation could break down biologically active forms of folate that were really important for health, our ears perked up because we recognized that if you had a physical force like ultraviolet radiation that was omnipresent in an, an environment in which hominins were living, and that this, this force was going to break down a molecule that was necessary for the synthesis and, and control of DNA production, as well as other essential processes, we realized that we really had the potential or the core of an evolutionary mechanism. Ultraviolet radiation destroying or reducing folate levels, folate being essential for many cellular and organismal processes. And one of the key insights that we received early on was the recognition that folate vitamin B9 that we get from citrus fruits, green vegetables, whole grains, is necessary for this early, earliest form of embryo formation. When most women don't even know they're pregnant in the first three weeks of pregnancy, the neural tube is forming. Oops. And oh, oh, Carla, can you help me get back to my normal view? Sorry. Sorry, I got carried away with my buttons. There we thank you. So um, folate is needed to, to power, as it were, all of the cell division, the DNA production, the cell division, that is necessary for this process of neurulation. If there is not enough folate in the diet, and women, no one can store folate. You must constantly replenish folate through the diet. So if you do not have enough folate, then what can occur is any one of these very serious uh, neural tube defects, what was one of the most common forms of birth defects before the era of folate supplementation in many of the cereals and grains today that we see. And folate continues, the, the story of folate continues to unfold in, in our work with collaborators, but also in the epidemiological literature. An excellent study 
published from investigators in Spain a few years ago, showing how folate levels in a normal population, this is on a sample of about 2,000 individuals, uh, that in the summertime when the solar radiation is, is in more intense and people are exposed to stronger solar radiation, that there are average or lower serum folate levels in the population uh, in the summer months. So people have often asked us, you know, can you, can you show that this is a likely evolutionary mechanism? And yes, we can make very strong uh, collections of environmental evidence. We can't subject women to strong ultraviolet radiation to test to see if this causes a birth defect, obviously. So there are limitations to, to experimental medicine on humans but we can certainly gather a lot of good uh, indirect evidence. And in work that I've been involved with at Penn State with my colleague Larry Kenny and his students, we have also shown that, that melanin is really important for maintaining the integrity of dilation of the blood vessels, vasodilation in the skin. Today, when you were walking around, hot, losing heat through radiative and evaporative cooling. You were using folate in order to dilate the blood vessels here in your skin in order to lose heat through your skin. Also, the, these dilated blood vessels help to provide blood to the eccrine sweat glands in your skin. So the eumelanin helps to protect the integrity of thermoregulation in the skin. So it's, it's a really important molecule. So we can now understand at least the beginning part of the story, evolution of dark pigmentation in early members of the genus Homo. And here again, uh, it's, it's now wonderful for us to do work with geneticists and genomicists who are studying the evolution of pigmentation genes in the human lineage, in different human populations, and in non-human primates and others. Because pigmentation genes are extremely complicated and wonderfully uh, different in their mechanism of action. And we know that one of the main changes that occurred, especially in African populations, was changes in the melanocortin-1 receptor locus. The elimination of variation in that locus helped to ensure the production of darkly pigmented skin that would protect individuals throughout their lifetimes. So dark skin is effectively prevented from, uh, protected from most UV-induced damage, including the effects on folate metabolism and multiple pathways affecting thermoregulation. So this, this, was, this is work that has accumulated over the last 23 years. But when we look at the, at the humans around us in Burgos and in this auditorium and elsewhere in the world, we see a tremendous, beautiful range of skin color. So we now need to explore where did the lighter shades of skin come from and how, when did these evolve and, and under what conditions. So I, I refer to this old map that was published by one of my colleagues, uh, sets of colleagues uh, several years ago, Brenna Hen and colleagues, who were studying the dispersals of modern people based on genetic evidence. Their dates here are now outdated, but the principle of their, of their illustration is important because what they show is that, first of all, humans Modern humans evolved in Africa, and we spent most of our evolutionary history in Africa. We have fossil evidence of early Homo sapiens, the transition to a Homo sapiens morphology, beginning more than 200,000 years ago, 
Tim has unearthed beautiful fossils from Herto at 160,000 years ago. And so we know that here in Africa, we have Homo sapiens for a long period of time, undergoing different kinds of, of sort of sub-radiations, moving around slowly, populations growing and shrinking under environmental conditions and populations moving around. And here, what we see are small populations that quite late in the story of Homo sapiens evolution begin to disperse out of Africa. This large arrow indicates the magnitude of the genetic bottleneck that occurred at this time. We often think that humans are going, you know, sort of in large numbers in these big parties off moving into new places. But I think we, we have our own sort of stories about human destinations and goal orientation. As, as our beloved colleague Desmond Clark used to say, these humans were simply looking for food. They, they moved with the animals upon which they depended and they moved in small groups. And these population bottlenecks really characterized human dispersals into, into the Afro-Arabian Peninsula, into Southeast Asia, and into other parts of the old world and eventually the new world. And the population bottlenecks were incredibly powerful effects on the genetic variation, including the genetic variation in pigmentation genes upon which natural selection could act. So I, we, we now can recognize the evidence of these bottlenecks and the evidence of gene flow, including introgression of genes from earlier homo populations that occur in the dispersal of modern humans and how these affected the process of natural selection and the broad phenomenon of adaptation. So here, if we, if we overlay quickly uh, our beautiful human ancestors around Homo sapiens ancestors 300,000 years ago and begin to, uh, to look at their, at their uh, marvelous radiation during which we evolved all of the accoutrements of modernity, all of the, the language sophistication, art, a variety of tool types, just tremendous amounts of modernity evolved at this time when we were, uh, when we were in Africa in the, uh, the late Middle and late Pleistocene. And here, we, some populations again move out, strong population bottlenecks, some we know are coming back in also, and populations moving into Southeast Asia, some from a staging post in central Eurasia going into Western Europe and some into Northeastern Europe, oops, and much later into North America. Again, with, with many important bottlenecks. But when we, when we overlay this, these arrows on the UV map, what we see not only at Atapuerca here, this is, this is an early, this is not modern humans, of course, at Atapuerca, but here, when modern humans are moving into sort of Atapuerca environments and farther north, they're moving into much lower ultraviolet radiation regimes than they experienced in their African homeland. And certainly for populations living here in northern Eurasia, this was especially important. So what happened? Well, what we see is the evolution of loss of eumelanin. We don't really see the evolution of light skin so much as the evolution of depigmentation, the evolutionary loss of pigmentation. Because this man on the left, this is George with a little bit more hair than he has today, <laughs> with, with our community leader at Waranso Mili, Ethiopia, Habib. Uh, this man on the left, can produce vitamin D in his skin much faster than the man on the right. If they're both outside for most of the day wearing what they're wearing here, 
they will both make ample amounts of, of, of vitamin D in their bodies in order to remain healthy. But George on the left will make it much faster having less natural sunscreen in his skin than Habib on the right. So they will both make vitamin D in their skin, but the eumelanin slows the process down. And as long as Habib lives in Ethiopia, he will maintain a very healthy life with ample amounts of vitamin D. So light skin is evolutionarily depigmented and less eumelanin allows for faster production of vitamin D in the skin. Vitamin D is a precious commodity for hominins and other mammals and vertebrates living at high latitudes. And they either have to make it in their skin or they have to eat sources of food such as oily fish or marine mammals or the muscle meat of some, of some mammals in order to get enough vitamin D to stay healthy under conditions of very low UV. So now when we look at these two lightly pigmented, evolutionarily depigmented individuals, one from, from Western Europe, one from Eastern Asia, it, it, we can see yeah, they've got this, this really interesting phenotype. And what genomic research has, has shown us in the last 20 years is that these two similar phenotypes have been achieved by different genetic pathways. Although there is one depigmentation gene, the Kit Ligon gene here, that is shared between both populations and was probably very important in, in ancestral Homo sapiens in Eurasia, all of the other genes that have been important in, in loss of eumelanin pigmentation are, are entirely different in these lineages. So that that makes any evolutionary biologist just extremely joyous because you realize this is the action of natural selection that has worked on the available genetic variation in order to produce similar phenotypes that would allow the production of more vitamin D under low UV conditions. A great evolutionary story. And from a paper that I, that I wrote a few years ago, I don't want to belabor this, but we were able to show, for instance, if we look at the, at the selection for depigmentation in tanning in Eurasia and the Americas, we can, uh, we can see that uh, in central Eurasia, and many of these genetic stories are still in the process of being investigated. We don't know the answers. We have uh, a lot of, of enhanced uh, population admixture, but also continued selection for tanning in Eurasia. In, in northern and northwestern Europe, we have very powerful uh, recent depigmentation with another genetic variant that is very, very widespread in northwestern Europe. And in East Asia, this Kit Ligon variant, again, under intensified selection, and as uh, in research led by Leslie Atlusko and, and others in this audience, uh, we were able to demonstrate that in populations going into Beringia and ultimately into the New World, that we not only see the, the ancestral variants, but also selection for EDAR, which uh, Leslie has very nicely demonstrated, is, is associated with branching patterns uh, in, the, in the human breast that help to provide vitamin D-rich breast milk to infants. So there's a lot of ways, interesting ways, to get vitamin D and, and propel survival. One really interesting case study, when we look at, at human habitation in, in the, the farthest sort of northwestern reaches of Europe here in, in, the, in the British Isles, very low levels of, of ultraviolet B radiation, even at the height of summer, even right now, and where we see maximum amounts of depigmentation of the skin, uh, this, this 
these different MC1R polymorphisms often leading to red hair individuals, and diets that are of necessity focused around vitamin D rich resources. Uh, many of the traditional people, for instance, in Scotland are storing cod or eating fresh cod and have ways of storing cod or herring in order to maintain vitamin D intake throughout the year because the sunlight is weak and seasonal and provides no opportunity for them to make vitamin D. So we call this the vitamin D compromise. And I think as, the, as this pigmentation story gets more exciting, we see that people around the world from different places have moderately to darkly pigmented skin. Whether we're looking at a woman from West Africa, from Polynesia, or Southern India, uh, skin that has a tremendous potential for tanning, for developing more protective eumelanin as a result of sun exposure. And we have this, this ability being linked to different clusters of genes, again, as a, as a result partly of the population bottlenecks and the tremendous diversity of pigmentation genes, different genes are being called upon or are, are being upregulated in order to produce more eumelanin or to package it differently in order to produce a tanned phenotype. And uh, I don't want to go into any details here, but you can see in this, in this spider web of a diagram, this is a, a sketch of a, of a pigment producing cell in the skin, just to show all of the different genes that are the most popular genes, the most powerful genes for regulating pigmentation here. Many, many, many of them acting on different parts of the melanin producing cell, as well as the packaging of melanin. And so many genes and gene variants associated with the loss of pigmentation and with tanning and occurring again under positive selection. So uh, this, is, this is beautiful to think of these similar traits of the visible phenotype evolving in parallel many times in human evolution. Clearly, the fact that you have lightly pigmented skin, darkly pigmented skin, evolving multiple times, renders these characteristics useless for the purpose of classification. In this lecture, I'm not going to go into uh, the details of how humans, naturalists, philosophers, of course, they use pigmentation to classify people. And this is certainly one of the big problems that today in most of the world, we are still stuck with the classifications from the 18th century that were based on skin color. So it's, it's important to think about this skin pigmentation as an evolutionary compromise, as a beautiful uh, process of, of adaptation. Here, uh, at the equator and close to the equator in areas with lots of, of sun year in and year out, a lot of protective melanin pigmentation, whereas at closer to the poles we see an emphasis on lighter pigmentation, loss of pigmentation to, uh, to promote photosynthesis, the production of vitamin D. A really nice example of evolution by natural selection. And I think if Darwin had had access to the same tools, to the same uh, uh, satellite data, to the same especially genetic information, he no doubt, may, he may not have had the, the ability to make George's map, but he certainly would have come up with some of the same conclusions. And we love this example. And for those of you who teach human evolution, to children or to adults or in your families, uh, and people ask you about the evolution of, of skin color, just use your own body as an example. We, have, we all have the best teaching tools right with us, portable uh, teaching of human evolution and the process of adaptation under natural selection. 
So what we can recognize as by way of, of concluding is that the evolution of skin pigmentation has been contingent and non-deterministic and that many random processes, especially genetic drift, were really important in this process. That there was an interplay of genetic, environmental, and cultural factors. We talk about, especially in modern populations that are becoming agricultural, the interplay between diet and vitamin D production or diet and sources of vitamin D in the diet and how people maintain health under these tenuous environmental conditions. And that the process has never been in equilibrium. There has always been some variation, not only because of the movements of people, but because of the nature of solar cycles that have caused some variation in the amounts and nature of ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth's surface. So this is, this is important, a dy dynamic and ever-changing process. And when we think about what does this mean? Is this important for life? Of course it's important for life because that balance between skin pigmentation and the environment has now mostly been disrupted. Where are you sitting? In the middle of a beautiful building, the built environment, which didn't exist even hundreds of years ago for most people, right? People would live in simple structures. They would work mostly outside. They would not spend very much time indoors. Our life, our modern life, our urban life is dramatically different from that of even our close ancestors. And to recognize the implications of this for health, especially for vitamin D deficiency, is really, really important. And I think some of you are working on this in your own research programs. So to think about how, how these, this balance has been disrupted by modern life and by all of the rapid long distance migrations of human populations that we still see and that we will increasingly see as there are more so-called climate refugees moving around the world to try to find a place to live safely. Let us all take the lessons of evolution, the lessons of our skin, enjoy putting skin on the bones of human evolution, because this is a continuing story, a continuing challenge to use multiple lines of evidence. Bones and stone tools and teeth are marvelous, and I love them. But also, we must think about these parts of the body that decompose as, as the body deteriorates, and how important they were in providing an interface with our physical environment, and how our survival was ultimately linked to how the skin and the hair functioned during life. So on that note, I hope I will inspire you to think and to appreciate your skin. And I want to thank uh, my wonderful, wonderful hosts here, uh, Maria, Leslia, Chitina, all of whom you know, helped, and all of you at the, at the uh, Cien, uh, Cien, <laughs> CENIEH <laughs> for, your, for your absolutely generous uh, spending of time with us in the last three days. We've had a spectacular time. I cannot thank you enough for your generosity in the lab here and at Atapuerca. Uh, and to George for all of the work over the years that continues. Uh, and my wonderful research assistant back at Penn State, Tess Wilson. And to many people and uh, for discussions and lots of people who provided money. So thank you very much. All of my publications are available for free download, or almost all of them. And you can always email me with questions. So thank you again for being so generous with your time and, and your facilities. Thank you. celebration of our anniversary and also in a way to try to return to you the, this, this gift, this generosity and oh. 
And in order for you to have also a memory of mm. your time here, which we hope you have, we want to give you this gift, which oh. is a sculpture made by Javier Sanz, which is a sculpture that represents the the logo of the CNIE, which is the hand they found in, in Atapuerca encima de los huesos. So, well, it is a pleasure to give you. Yes, maybe. Yes. 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 Thank you. 